So episode one of Secret Invasion, I was about to call it Secret War, Secret Invasion is on Disney Plus, and I for one am pretty excited because, yeah, the other Disney Plus shows, uh, they got problems, but this one's got Sam Jackson, and I love Samuel L. Jackson, and I'm a big fan of Samuel L. Jackson, so at the very least, I know that even if this show winds up sucking, even if it does end up sucking, I've still got my Sam Jackson, so... Episode 1 did premiere on Disney+, Plus, and I'm going to give you my thoughts on Episode 1 right now of Secret Invasion. The show is going to assume that you've been caught up to the MCU, that you've seen things like WandaVision, that you've seen Captain Marvel as much as that movie, of course, people don't like it. It still was the first movie to really discuss the Kree scroll War because the plot of this show is that there are scrolls on the planet, shapeshifters that are hiding and pretending to be humans. And this is established in the very first scene, even before the opening credits of this episode, it's established right off the hop that there are scrolls everywhere. Ben Mendelsohn's character obviously was the one that we got to know in pre prior MCU projects, and he's going to be a big force in this show. But we're supposed to know that there are people on Earth, kind of like the Men in Black, it sort of reminds me of that kind of vibe, there are people on Earth who aren't really aliens. They're shapeshifters. Sounds like a bad conspiracy theory. Where's David Icke at? No, but uh, <laughs> it, they're here, and they're not all necessarily on the side of good. So we're supposed to watch this show and kind of try to figure out who really is human and who isn't. So when you're watching the show, it's counting on you to kind of be on edge and to not really be sure what is what, who is who, and to always distrust what you see, and I like that. There's very few shows that can really get away with that. I think WandaVision did it for the first few episodes where we didn't really trust what we were seeing. Like, is it inside of her head? Is it in an alternate universe or a pocket dimension? This is a similar idea, you know what I mean? The main story is that Nick Fury has returned from space and uh, from Saber, and he meets up with Ben Mendelsohn's character Talos, and we find out that there are, there's like a splinter group of scrolls that are not part of his group of scrolls that are hiding on Earth for nefarious means. And so that sort of kicks off the story, and then we're kind of introduced to these different characters as this first episode goes along to kind of set the foundation for where the story's gonna go. We're introduced to the character of Sonya, who works for MI6, and she's kind of the one that's briefing Nick Fury on what's going on, and how there's basically this splinter group of scrolls that I mentioned earlier, um, being led by this guy named Gravik, played by Kingsley ben -Adir, and he's basically, I guess he's going to be the antagonist of the show, I, one could come to that conclusion, and they're trying to infiltrate certain world powers, for their own benefit. It's not just that they're hiding on Earth to, you know, avoid any kind of intergalactic issues or just to live amongst the people peacefully. They actually have a, a much deeper, more nefarious, um, I guess, purpose. Also, I want to comment that Dermot Mulroney plays Ritson, which is the president of the U.S. If you remember, though, back in Iron Man 3, the president was played by William Sadler and uh, Bill Sadler. And um, that actually, I like that touch because obviously way more than four years have passed since Iron Man and it would have annoyed me if they would have had the same guy playing the president when you know it's been years since Iron Man 3. So I like that we have a new president in charge even though I really did like Bill Sadler as the president in Iron Man 3. Something I noticed in this episode, of course, uh, Rhodey is still very close to the president like he was in the Iron Man movies and... Don Cheetah will have a big role in this show as well as we go into the Iron Heart story and the um, Armor Wars coming up, you know, down the road. One of the big story points in this episode is the introduction of a character known as Gaia, uh, played by Amelia Clark, and her interaction with Talos. Now, it's interesting because Amelia Clark and Ben Mendelsohn are both major players in the. Again, it's sort of like it's it's not really a coincidence because. These actors are doing a lot of work in Hollywood, but I find it, 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 I mean, it is a coincidence. It is in a way. I find it funny how one plays Kira in the Solo, a Star Wars story, and one plays uh, Director Krennic in Rogue One, the two Disney-made prequel movies 
that came out during the Disney era for Star Wars, and they're both together here, but they're playing very different characters. So the story here is that Talos knew Gaia's like mom, and she has aligned herself with the Gravik um, faction. So she's with the evil faction, and they kind of have this relationship where it appears like Ben Mendelsohn's character is going to try and talk to her and get her to understand, you know, the truth about what's going on and about her mom. And, you know, she, um, you know, and what would actually happen. Now, what's interesting is this character was shown before. She was a kid in Captain Marvel. Now, I didn't remember that. I had to look that up because I've only seen Captain Marvel once. Um, and I'm not even one of those guys that hates that movie like so many people on YouTube does. It's not the best movie, but it's not one of the ones that I hate. It's not my least favorite. I still think that Thor 2 The Dark World is probably the worst one. But uh, yeah, I don't remember that character, but I had to look it up. So it's the same character. It's just that now she's older. And it's weird because Amelia Clark, I've seen her in a bunch of things. And I don't know if it's like maybe my own eyes or if it's the effects that are used here, but she looks really short. And, I, and she's not like a tall actress, but here she looks like remarkably shorter. Like she looks younger than, I guess, Amel like like G Gaia looks remarkably remarkably younger than Amelia Clark actually is. Amelia Clark's 36. She ain't that young, right? She's not that old either, but here she looks younger. Um, and they may have done that on purpose. So it's not really a big deal. But it is something that's worth discussing because this is a major plot point going forward. It all leads to the big sort of like final sequence or the, the big sort of um, surprise ending, I guess you can say. Uh, I guess you can call it that at the end of the episode. Now, most of this show, at least from what we've seen, takes place in Moscow, which is interesting considering what's going on in the real world with Russia. But this is, of course, the MCU, and even though they can borrow ideas from the real world, they have their own problems. <laughs> Literally, a space force that pretend, well, a space race that's pretend to be humans infiltrating humanity. That's a little bit more serious in some cases, as some would say, than what's going on in the real world, even though for us it's not. If this were happening to us, it'd be kind of crazy, right? And some think it is, but anyways, nevertheless, Maria Hill and uh, Nick Fury are there, and there seems to be like a an explosion in this like building that they're that they're around now again they're doing that thing i mentioned earlier in the review where they're trying to mess with you maria hill gets shot right in the stomach right and the way it's shot it looks like it's nick fury but of course i'm i'm not falling for this i did not fall for this because i knew going into this show they were gonna try and mess with me they were gonna try to mess with me and I saw it coming, so it's not really Nick Fury. It's obviously a scroll pretending to be him because the real Nick Fury shows up. But just having Maria Hill get shot in the stomach and possibly be dead is already enough of a shocking twist, I think, to keep people tuned into the show. But it could also be a fake out because, I mean, for all we know, she might not even be really her. Um, it could also be a fake out because, remember, in the first Avengers movie, they do something very, very similar with Coulson. Right, where he, he dies, but he's not really dead, but you think he's dead, and that's what kind of brings the Avengers together. It's hard for me to believe anybody's going to actually stay dead in this franchise, in the MCU, even though maybe I should. It's kind of become like Dragon Ball now, where they've done so many fake-out deaths that I don't know who's really dead and who's not. It's not quite to the absurdity of, as like the Fast movies, but still. So anyways, she gets shot in the stomach. Nick Fury sees that the other fake Nick Fury did it, and approaches, and it's revealed to be Gravik, and of course they did that to build heat, to get to get the audience to immediately hate this character as a villain and want to see him get put down because he killed a character that has been with the MCU since what, like Phase One? She's been there since Phase One, right? I, I think she was in the she was in the first Avengers movie, so she's been there quite some time. Maybe not one of the most beloved characters, but one that people certainly have fond memories of. Let's not forget that Avengers came out, you know, eleven years ago, and there are people who saw that movie as kids who are now adults. Not me; I was an adult back then too. But I mean, some people are growing up with this character, so seeing her die might have an emotional emotional resonance with people. Uh, or seeing her get shot, that is. But it seriously does feel like they're trying to sell us on the fact that she's dead. 
they really are trying to hammer that point home, and it does seem like she really did die. Very tragic ending, but also a very surprising one, and one that's going to kick the show off, right? Because now we know who the good guys are, we know who the bad guys are, but the key is, we don't really know who the bad guys are, because... Meaning, in the literal sense, we don't know who they're masquerading as. So that is the end of episode one of Secret Invasion. Overall, not a bad first episode. Probably not the most impactful one. I feel like the premieres of the uh, Captain America or the Falcon and Winter Soldier show and Loki were probably a bit stronger, I would say. But this still has me intrigued only because I kind of like the way this show is trying to keep me guessing and I think that that aspect of the show will be enough to keep me interested uh, I really do think that I like this kind of storytelling where they're kind of messing with the audience and subverting your expectations if it's done right and if you're going to have a show about shape-shifting alien invasions you might as well do it now you know what I mean so five more episodes to go I think it's only six episodes they're like 40 to 50 minutes long so We'll see what happens next week. Anyways, y'all, take care, have a good one, and I'll see you very soon. Thumbs up for this episode.